sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, and heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But, uh, here's a holy word, it turns it around, but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, or envying one another. You may be seated, and I certainly ask you to keep your Bibles open in front of you as well as the outlines that you have there. As we kind of begin to look at the end, so to speak, of uh, the series for this summer, somebody said that the first day of fall is 22 days from today. All right? Um, uh, you can feel it in the air, can't you? Okay, you can feel it on my face because you guys know I start my beard on Labor Day and I cut it off by about Easter time. So, Tony, I'll start looking like you next week, okay? All right, um, uh, but, but when we take a look at this, um, in essence, the church should be like a cornucopia, did I say it right, of spiritual fruits. Um, if you don't know what a cornucopia is, you'll, you'll see kids making those in the fall of the year, the horn of plenty. Uh, here we see nine fruits. They are fruits of the Spirit. They're different than the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and I think it's possible for any one Christian to display all of these fruits. Um, you and I, it would be silly for any of us to say, well, I have peace and so I don't need the rest of the fruits, right? Um, in my personal opinion... I think that as you and I display more of the fruits of the Holy Spirit, we might think that we're growing up, that we're maturing. We might think that, and I think that's okay. But if we, if we just have one or two of them, we shouldn't say, well, we'll let's just cut it off there. Uh, I think verse 26 actually speaks against that. Um, when we begin this passage of Scripture, we see the opposite of the fruits of the Spirit, and that is the works of the flesh. And may I say this, that the body, the human body, is not necessarily sinful. Um, I don't think you and I should say, but I couldn't help myself. Now, I know that when you take a look at the chocolate ice cream in the freezer, that it's hard to fight the urge to eat the whole thing, okay? Um, uh, I actually eat out of the container with a fork, I eat ice cream with a fork out of the container, okay? Ask me why, I don't know. But when I see ice cream up in the freezer, it is hard for me to resist. Anybody there? But you and I should not ever have to say, but I couldn't help myself. Um, the body is not sinful in and of itself. It's neutral. Uh, think of this. An athlete might be lazy, might be energetic, might be hyperactive. Uh, the Christian, if we're filled by the Holy Spirit and controlled by the Holy Spirit, then we walk in the Spirit and we experience the results of that, the consequences of it, right? If we walk in the Holy Spirit, we should experience some of the results of walking in the Holy Spirit. But if the flesh controls the body and we walk in the desires of the flesh, then we reap those repercussions as well. Um, I'll throw this out at you. The spirit and the flesh have two different appetites. Um, Jesus said this, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. And then he said this, Matthew chapter 26, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so Jesus acknowledged to us that there is this battle always going on. Um, Paul verbalized it in Romans chapter 7. And I'll just paraphrase, but he said this, uh, the good that I wish I did, I don't do. 
Uh, and the bad or the evil that I don't want to do, I find myself doing. And then he says this, who shall deliver us from such a battle as this? I'm paraphrasing. But who shall deliver us from this? In verse 25 of Romans 7, Paul says this, I thank God. And then there's a pause. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's deliverance from this battle that every human being fights in Jesus Christ our Lord. And God's people said amen, right? But the opposite uh, appetites that we see are illustrated a couple of places in the Scripture. Uh, Mind you, uh, the 23rd Psalm. Um, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in... uh, He leadeth me beside the... Okay, good, good. Now, there is the sheep that have an appetite for green pastures and still waters. All right? Oh, oh, but let's go over to Second Peter, I think, chapter 2. Um, you clean up a hog, all right, and some of you are very familiar with what hogs do, but you take them to a pet wash. I never heard of people taking a, a hog to a pet wash. And you clean him up and you sparkle him up real good and you take him back to the farm. And the first thing he does is what? Waller in the mud, okay? Uh, so there are two different appetites here. By the way, in the Scripture... People are never called hogs. People are referred to as sheep. We might be in the sheepfold or we might be lost sheep, but that's how we're compared to in the Scripture. Um, Think of uh, Noah in the ark. Um, He sends out two birds, one a raven, one a dove. The raven did not come back. Do you know why? Because that raven would have floated around on dead carcasses and eating off of them. Wow, I just ruined your lunch, didn't I? But the doves came back because there was no clean place for them to land. Okay? Um, uh, I can shoot and eat a wild turkey, but I don't want to shoot and eat a turkey vulture. Oh, oh, I'm really destroying lunch for us, aren't aren't I? Okay, but I don't want to eat... All right, let's, let's move on. Unfortunately... Unsaved people know very little about this battle. And may I remind you of the time that you got saved, that when you trusted Christ as your Savior, all of a sudden um, um, that battle of the flesh and spirit really came into focus, didn't it? Um, That once we let Christ in our hearts, all of a sudden we're aware of those things now, whereas before, hmm, just went and did them, okay? Uh, the Christian can't just will to overcome the flesh. We can't just will ourselves to overcome the flesh. Do you know why? Because we are of the flesh. We just can't change our minds. Um, uh, One of the contentions that I have with many rehab programs is that they leave Jesus Christ out of the formula. If we leave Jesus Christ out of the formula, we can't change anything because we're still in the flesh, right? All right, so point made, um, and anybody that's listening to me from a rehab program, uh, may I say this? Pick up your Bible. Start reading. Start trusting Christ. That's where the healing is. Amen, everybody? That's where it is. Um, uh, Let me just tell you a quick story. Uh, for about a year, I was the director of the youth rehab program in Warren County called Mary Haven. And uh, one night, uh, I was working evenings then, and I just saw that I just needed to do something with 20 juvenile delinquents in one building. And so about bedtime, I told everybody to gather into one room, and I was going to read them some Bible stories. Got my Bible out. Sure enough, and I remember this kid, I could draw his face for you. His first name was Jeff. Jeff went to the light switch and turned it off. Now we're in the dark. And I said, Jeff, why did you do that? Here is his answer. Aren't these going to be spooky stories? Now that's what he thought. I said, no, turn the light back on and listen to this. But it made me realize 
that here's a rehab program, program for juvenile delinquents, and he didn't know what was in the book. Okay, point made. Let's keep moving along, okay? Uh, therefore, we cannot win the victory in our own strength or by our own will. The solution is that we submit our will to the Holy Spirit. We surrender our will to the Holy Spirit. Ah, here comes the verse. But if you are willing, if you're willing fully led by the Spirit, that's what we have to be. We have to be led by the Spirit. And when this happens, our desire is to please Jesus in love. And so, being led by the Spirit, we're walking in the Spirit. And that's the opposite of yielding to the desires of the flesh. Now, by the way, back yonder when I taught driver's ed, I would ask a kid, what does yielding mean in traffic? And I would never let them use the word in the definition. Well, then they were confused. Okay, what does yielding mean? When you get on the interstate, okay, you know, you're supposed to yield to traffic already there. How many people don't know that? All right, okay. All right. Uh, but listen, yielding means giving way. I'm giving way to the Holy Spirit. That's what it means to yield to the Holy Spirit. Give way to Him. Now first, let's talk about this, the ugly works. I don't want to expound on these too much because you and I are very familiar with them, aren't we? Uh, but the works of the flesh are uh, outlined here. They're also outlined in Mark chapter 7, Romans chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now, the reason the Bible uses this word, the works of the flesh, is because a machine produces a product. And that's the opposite of a fruit being born by a tree. Okay, now, l let me help you with this. Uh, you go to a factory and there's machines and they're putting out a product, right? Uh, that product comes by work and labor and sweat. But the Bible gives us a beautiful illustration of this in verse 22. And the works of the flesh are placed in juxtaposition, notice that I knew, knew that word, against the fruit of the Spirit. Um, when, when a tree bears a fruit, uh, it's fragrant, it's pretty, uh, it's, it's a process, and, and it's nice and slow, it's neat. Um, in the spring of the year, I look at my apple tree almost every day because all of a sudden I'm seeing that bloom get a little bit fat, and it gets fatter and fatter, and all of a sudden the bloom's gone. The fruit is being born, right? Uh, this summer, I've had a garden like I've never had in my lifetime. I've been picking things out of my garden all summer long, nearly every day because the fruit is, is being born. And so when we take a look at the works of the flesh, think of a piece of machinery that spits out a product. Um, by the way, Jeremiah chapter 17. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. There are three major categories here. There are sensual sins. Adultery, which is sin between married people. Fornication, which is sin involving unmarried people. Uncleanliness, filthiness of heart. Uh, maybe your Bibles uses the word lasciviousness, uh, lewdness, debauchery, um, uh, depraved, sick, uh, a wanton appetite with no shame. Uh, there's a second category, and those are superstitious sins. Uh, in other words, they are somewhat spiritual in the sense that that is mentioned idolatry or witchcraft, uh, those kinds of things. By the way, I think a good thing to a way to think about idolatry is this: you and I are to worship God, love people, and use things. Now, let me repeat that: you and I, as Christians, are to worship God, love people, and use things. If we get that out of order, you and I are probably dabbling with idolatry. Okay? You know that people like to use people instead of using things. Right? Or they like to love things instead of love people. 
right? And that's where we get into idolatry. If we worship anything else but God, that's idolatry. Um, 